wonder if it's time. Yes. Turn on. Um. Are corporate health programs worth the time and effort? Medical reporter Catherine Pratt is here with a program that promises lasting results. Catherine? Kim, health experts say corporate-sponsored weight loss, exercise, and quit smoking programs are effective, but the effects are short-lived. The reason? Most programs depend on individual heroics. Once back in the workplace, the heroes backslide. But wellness gurus at Deaconess Hospital say they have a better idea. Don Ardell is the author of High Level Wellness, credited with starting the wellness movement over a decade ago. Now he's working with corporate health programs around the country, like this one headed up by David Randall of Deaconess Hospital. But Ardell says Randall's program is unique. It goes beyond the temporary effects of other corporate health programs. By changing employee attitudes toward themselves and their workplace, Randall goes for the breakthrough performance. First time the term was used was Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile and was called a breakthrough performer because he not only exceeded the norm but also beyond expectations. And we're teaching our employees the traits that uh, breakthrough performers have that are teachable skills that they can become breakthrough performers too in the work that they do. To promote the wellness and breakthrough concept, Deaconess Hospital is sponsoring a week-long seminar on the Mississippi Queen Steamboat. Want to go on a cruise? Cruising along the Mississippi is the most delicious adventure ever devised. But uh, a breakthrough, wellness, what, what is that all about? I oh. wonder. Why don't you sign up, Sam, and give it a shot? Well, I might uh, just, I might do just that. Deaconess Health Service Corporation and Healthy America, it's my pleasure to welcome you aboard the breakthrough cruise on the luxurious Mississippi Queen. The mighty Mississippi becomes our metaphor for change and growth, part of the breakthrough concept. You know, some of us carry some of the cultural baggage of what might be called a low-level, worseness lifestyle. Well, in the next few days together, we'll have the opportunity to explore several dimensions of a wellness lifestyle. In addition, we'll learn the concepts of breakthrough performance and the skills needed to be breakthrough performers ourselves. To help us in this process, we've invited some of the leading experts from around the country. Dr. Robert F. Allen, author of Life Game, the organizational unconscious, a leading expert in cultural change and a poet. Dr. Don Ardell, author of High Level Wellness, History and Future of Wellness, 14 Days to Wellness Lifestyle, and publisher of the Ardell Report. Tom Crum, co-founder of the Windstar Foundation and a leading expert in the Japanese art of Aikido. And a gentleman whom I've not yet met, a Mr. Clemens, who I understand has also done some writing. Hi, welcome aboard. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Clemens is my name, uh, Samuel Clemens. Okay, and your destination is? Uh, Hannibal, Missouri. Okay. Here's your receipt, Mr. Clemens. Oh, uh, thank you. Here's your room key. Very well. And if you please go over and see the maitre d' about making arrangements for your seating for dinner. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All sure for visitors, please. All sure. <laughs> Well, we'll need to adjourn for now. The boat is scheduled to cast off in just a few minutes. I'm sure that many of you will want to be on deck for that. Have an enjoyable evening, and we'll see you tomorrow on the sun deck for exercises led by Tom Crump.
wonderful setting and uh, such a wonderful opportunity for all of us, any of us who were up on deck this morning watching the sun come up and, uh, and getting related to this environment that we're in and at the same time related to ourselves, couldn't help but think that this is kind of the epitome of wellness, you know. And, and hopefully one of the things that we'll be doing this morning is not just talking about supportive environments, but uh, really dealing with some of the issues uh, involved with it. What we're going to do in the next few minutes is get to know some people we don't really know. Okay, so pick out somebody here that you don't know. Okay, okay, somebody you don't know. Good morning, how are you? Sam, nice to see you. Nice to make your acquaintance. Yeah, well, nice to see you, Sam. And what we're doing is uh, is talking a little bit with one another, uh, kind of talking about building healthier lifestyles. Is that something you're interested in? Very recently, I have uh, only a very few uh, rules that I live by to have reached my age. I make it a habit never to smoke more than one cigar at a time. I have no other restrictions. That's certainly, uh, that's certainly an impressive start, Sam. Uh, we at our Human Resources Institute have been involved uh, working on various uh, cultural change programs. These have ranged from changes in prisons to changes in migrancy to changes in productivity among workers and morale, quality control in organizations, all sorts of things. And I've never found an area that offers greater potential than the one we're here talking about. This whole question of wellness and, and possibilities. I've never also found an area that seems to me to be more related, our success, to be more related to the kind of cultural environments that we provide. I first became aware of this uh, when I finished my PhD in New York City, I guess it was 26 years ago. And I got a job, and the job was a wonderful one. First of all, it paid a lot of, paid some money, which was great for a PhD, next PhD candidate, and uh, that was neat. But it really gave me a chance to do some wonderful things. It was working with delinquent youngsters. And what we were doing was providing individual psychotherapy for delinquent kids. Kids like me, I like the kids, the supervisor, like, everything seemed to be going very, very well until something happened. And what happened was the kids started to graduate from the program. And when they graduated from the program and went home, in the first few weeks, a few kids got into trouble, and the first, next few weeks, a few more, and a few more, and a few more, until finally they were all back into trouble again. Right? So I had what would be called an early midlife crisis. You know what I mean? It's shocking. You know? even, if I, even if I didn't say anything, somebody was going to notice that this wasn't proving very effective. So the first thing I did, I went and talked with my friends. And I said, how you doing? And they were doing just as badly as I was doing. I said, it must be experience. So I went to the more experienced people, and right away I knew they were doing worse. Because what they said to me was not to worry. That's the way things were. <laughs> right? And, and it, you know, you just had to understand that that was the way that things happened. Well, what I found from that, uh, after seeing that, I talked with my supervisors, and I had a chance to, to live with these kids in, over in a ghetto section of New York City, and I had a chance to see how they were being influenced by their cultures. And we be it became clear to us that if we couldn't help these kids to understand how their cultures were affecting them, do you see how their cultures were affecting them? Then when they went home, they would get right back into the trouble they were in before. While they were in our culture, everything was fine. When they went back home, they went right back into the old culture. Now that's what happens to many of us, do you know, and many of the people that we, we work with. So what's the answer to that? Well, those kids couldn't change the whole uh, culture of New York City or the culture, but what they could do was build small supportive cultures for themselves. And when they did that, we were able to reduce recidivism by as much as 80 and 85 percent over long periods of time in carefully controlled studies and so on. So that's what led me to this, this concept, and we've been applying it to all sorts of things since then with really remarkable results. And what this means, of course, is not that individual knowledge and skills and commitments are not important, they're extremely important, right? It's that individual knowledge and skills, when accompanied by cultural support systems, can really carry people the long way. The, that's kind of a premise of our breakthrough, breakthrough program. Uh, studies all show that we're not going to have much t trouble getting people to want to change. Most people who smoke want to stop smoking. I might even think Mr. Clemens, by the time he gets off the boat, would want to stop smoking. It's easy to give up smoking, and I have uh, over a thousand times now. <laughs> if I might take another moment, I, it reminds me of an elder lady friend of mine 
She was beyond all medical attention. And I told her I would have her on her feet in the matter of a week. She had to cut out smoking, drinking, swearing, and uh, staying out late at night and all sorts of things. And she says, well, I cannot do it. And I said, well, why can't you? Well, I never done any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so there she was. <laughs> uh, sinking the ship. <laughs> no ballast to throw overboard. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go into, uh, folks, you got to go into old age with some bad habits. <laughs> for when you need them. It's been great to have this experience of being on a journey as we learn about breakthrough this week. So, Dr. Randall, just what kind of person uh, could learn to be a breakthrough performer? You know, the good news, Virginia, is that each and every one of us can be breakthrough performers. There are traits that are available to all of us that we can all acquire and we can all pursue. This wellness seems like clean living. The breakthrough seems like education. You know, I think uh, soap and education are the best policy. They're, they're more uh, efficient than a general massacre because they're more deadly in the long run. Sam, the researchers have found that 53% of premature deaths in this country are related not to a wellness lifestyle or breakthrough, but to the low-level worseness lifestyles. I know, they've been saying that uh, I, I smoke extravagantly, I like a volcano, and I drink like a fish. Sam, the basic question is, are you happy with the lifestyle that you're living? Well, my habits protect my life. Uh, they might assassinate yours, but so I do not advise it to you. Uh, my doctor, he don't advise it either. We've learned that the wellness lifestyle is an important part of the breakthrough concept. The breakthrough concept, though, includes many more dimensions. It includes skills in conflict resolution, team building, motivation, dealing with change, enhancing our creativity, time management, really making our work and play exciting, becoming one. The breakthrough performance is defined as operating at peak capacity or efficiency, achieving beyond the norm or even beyond expectation. And at the core of the breakthrough concept is clarifying our own purposes, our own spiritual values and ethics of what our life is about and taking responsibility for whatever choice that may be. In Healthy America, we have learned that it's not enough to take responsibility for making changes. We also need to take responsibility for sustaining those changes, both within ourselves and within our organizations. To understand this complexity, I've developed what I call the iceberg model. Now don't worry, there aren't too many icebergs uh, floating down the Mississippi that the ship will run into. On the other hand, as a breakthrough performer, you can take the attitude of being prepared for anything but expecting nothing. Bob Allen had us introduce each other this morning and we got to know what we might call the tip of the iceberg, the surface things about each other. But to understand each other more, we need to go below the surface to the level we call lifestyles. Lifestyles such as what are our nutritional practices, exercise habits, stress management, human relations skills, smoking, alcohol behaviors, and so forth. will determine our state of health that people see on the surface. But why do we choose one lifestyle over another? Doesn't it have to do with something deeper that we call our personal style or motivation? But why are we motivated? Why do we get payoffs for one thing and not another? Ultimately, we need to look to the base of that iceberg, our spiritual values and ethics how we consciously or unconsciously answer questions such as what does it mean to be a human being? 
What is my purpose in life? What do I want from life? What do I want to give from life? How we answer those questions, consciously or unconsciously, will determine what our motivation is, what lifestyles we'll choose, and ultimately what others will see on the surface, the tip of the iceberg. If we just worry about changing the tip of the iceberg, chiseling a little bit away of that, more keeps floating to the surface. So our ships of change will be sabotaged unless we get down to the base of the iceberg. Now everything that I've just presented on the left side of the model is strongly influenced by the right side of the model, our cultures. The tip of the iceberg, we observe that we all belong to groups with different kinds of organizational health. And this health is supported by the support systems of that organization. And those support systems are influenced by the norms, the way things are in that organization. And the norms are chosen consciously or unconsciously by what, by what we call the cultural vision. To be effective in changing our organizations, like changing ourselves as individuals, we need to get at the base of the iceberg, the vision of what our organization is about. If we really want to be more effective in coming closer to being breakthrough performers, we're going to need to take into account both sides of the iceberg model. Our concept of wellness has five dimensions, with the core being the base of the iceberg, the spiritual values and ethics. Wellness implies a sense of wholeness, of meaning, direction, and purpose, which is in the core of everything else. Surrounding the core are the dimensions of nutrition and fitness, stress and breakthrough performance, self-responsibility, and cultural and environmental sensitivity. We've already explored the cultural and environmental sensitivity dimension. Looking at another dimension, nutrition and fitness, we need to be very clear that it, food is more than just something to eat. The average American consumes 130 pounds of sugar each year and consumes far too much caffeine, salt, and cholesterol as well. We clearly have a choice in what we eat, and what we eat clearly relates to our performance. To improve your nutrition, eat more complex carbohydrates and less fat, salt, and sugar. Complex carbohydrates, such as fruits and vegetables and whole grains, are important. We had um, wonderful uh, food. We had fresh vegetables, uh, fresh fruits, and grains, bread, and home-baked. Do you think maybe nowadays the change in the way foods are prepared probably is causing us a lot of the have to change our lifestyle and be a little bit more cautious about what we do? Well, if you put all kinds of things in uh, food that doesn't originally come with it, you're probably going to um, upset your system some way or another. Just like... Um... <laughs> What's our challenge right now? We're sitting here, drinking by the river, looking at the view. Well, I think your challenge is uh, giving me to get up, uh, give up smoking. <laughs> important part of this dimension. Studies have shown that less than 15% of the American population exercises vigorously at least three times a week for 30 minutes per session. What is more common is that we buy our running shoes to watch the All-Star Game on TV and do curls with our beer can as we watch. up and join us in my key class. It'd be great for you to get a little exercise. Well, when it um, comes to exercise, 
Well, when a sudden impulse to exercise settles down over my spirit, I quickly lay down till it goes away. Here on the cruise, in addition to the morning exercise sessions, we'll be taking some measurements of our physical fitness so that we can have a gauge of our progress in our own wellness plans. We'll test for body fat, flexibility, lung capacity and efficiency, and we'll enter these results into the computerized whale, a series of four lifestyle questionnaires on nutrition, fitness, stress, and health risks. When we incorporate good nutrition and fitness into our lives, we're increasing our chances for breakthrough performance. We then can work on developing skills in stress management. The skills for successful stress management are the same skills required to be a breakthrough performer. Researchers have found that breakthrough performers are able to preserve good health amidst the most stressful crises. The issue is not what causes stress, but how we will respond to it. Breakthrough performers have learned to respond to stressors in three ways that the average person is not. First, they are risk takers. They have learned to focus on the opportunity that the stressful events present rather than on the potential dangers. In doing so, they also focus on the here and now as opposed to the way things used to be or the ideal that they would like them to become. And I, I notice you've uh, gone round that shoal over there. You have an eye like a, a hawk. Second, they are internally motivated to give their best in whatever the situation is. Breakthrough performers have made their work and play one, so they are fully involved in what they are doing. What do you do about the rain, Captain Foley? Well, we fight it out. Play with it. Challenge it. The worse it gets, the more fun we have. Third, they take responsibility for their lives. The response to a stressful event is within their control. They take initiative to make things happen rather than wait for them to occur. They can choose to be centered in any stressful situation that life presents. The stress in your life is a predictor of your health. Far more significant, however, is the way that you choose to respond to that stress. We can choose to resist stress, or we can choose to flow with it. Anywhere in the world you ask them to be strong, what do they do? This. You bend their arm. That's all I'm doing, trying to bend their arm. If I ask them to be really strong, this is a matter of life or death, what do you think people do around the world? They really tense up. It's, it's obvious. They go, okay, I'm gonna make it. And this is what they do. When the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? Another anchor in our, in our life. What's interesting about it is that when you test this level of strength, strength through rigidity, you actually create weakness. And it's testable, verifiable. As she tenses, as she becomes rigid, she cuts off something very powerful. And that's something called energy flowing, life force. Now, instead let energy flow. Now, have you ever tried to bend a fire hose? It's very, very difficult. It's difficult to bend the hose, not because of the hose, but because of the what? The water doing what? Flowing. So I want you to, from here, infinite supply, there's the nozzle, let that energy flow out. And just spray it right through Bob, all the way out through the trees, as far as you can conceptualize. No limitations. Just let it keep letting it flow. And don't let it bend now, and just keep wiggling the fingers, and keep the energy flowing, and just let it flow. Now you're gonna find something fantastic. It's like I'm, you're not doing anything no. and you're wondering what is this gorilla hanging on the arm sweating trying to bend it for? <laughs> True power is letting go of tension and it's also establishing an alignment so energy flows. So with each other I want you to experience this. It's a very 
powerful <laughs> feeling <laughs> trying to bend this person's arm and all she's doing is laughing. Puts energy into keeping me from doing that. It's like a river. Here's a river flowing down, stopping. Right here, it's going that direction. I need to go in the same direction. Just That's like close. a pilot on the Mississippi. Here is the Mississippi River. And here is the pilot. And you must know the river and go with its flow in its direction. Otherwise, uh, you'd end up on a snag or on the shoals or, or some other demolishment to your vessel. And so if you go with how it flows, then you are in control. Ah, thank you very much. So far in our journey together, we've begun with the core of the spiritual values and ethics and looked at the cultural and environmental sensitivity dimension, the nutrition and fitness dimension, the stress and breakthrough performance dimension. Now we would like to have Dr. Don Ardell assist us in earning our own black belts in the dimension of self-responsibility. important that we not uh allow people to stay focused on the idea that they're healthy if they're not sick, which is the prevailing rule in the medical system. And that's one that's hazardous because then people are motivated to think towards breakthrough. They think they're healthy when they're not sick. Uh, Freud was once asked, what does he do in psychoanalysis? And I thought his response was great for understanding the medical system. So what we do is to work with people who are historically unhappy and bring them back to a state of normal unhappiness like everybody else. <laughs> and our medical system, on which we lavish $370 billion a year, is set up to get people back to a state of normal non-sickness like everybody else. Which we, of course, have, having been exposed to the ideas of breakthrough, we find unacceptable. So that's why we want to develop the techniques that will help us succeed and put these good ideas to use. Uh, we've been getting a lot of information about nutrition. Uh, we know that we don't have to be health nuts in order to live right, that we don't have to be consumed by fears of hazards and junk foods, and that we're at the whim of what's available. Uh, we realize that the advice that we get from dietitians is more or less consistent with uh, what the evidence shows. It helps us not just avoid disease, but do reasonably well in terms of energy levels. We've learned that there's a lot more to stress management than what has traditionally been presented having to do with just techniques and that the extent to which we're conditioned physically and that we're eating right, that we feel good about ourselves and that we're in decent relationships with others, in fact, joyful relationships and all these other connected areas. And now we're learning about centeredness, all key issues in that, so we don't turn into pumpkins by uh, every day, or by midday. Fitness naturally is crucial and you know about the basics having to do with by wellness vital signs you know about the kinds of activities that provide the best aerobic benefits. Now it comes time after getting all this information, a little recap such as this has been, to start thinking about, okay, how does all this relate to me and what am I gonna do about it? There is a close connection between personal well-being or, or at least a commitment to personal well-being and how well institutions perform because they have teams of individuals who have a value for quality. And there are the individuals who, as you've been hearing this week, value some of those characteristics that were shown to be associated with America's best run companies. Now it's time to talk about a plan. We've got all this information, we're excited about it, we have time to devote to it. To identify goals consistent with those check marks you've made, goals that are spe time specific and goals that are measurable. I'll give you some examples of, of goals. And remember, they can be in a variety of life areas. We're not just talking nutrition, fitness, and stress management. Uh, here are some examples of goals that are specific and measurable. I will work up to exercising six times weekly for 30 minutes per session for the next two months. Does that seem measurable and specific? Sure. Uh, in the area of stress management, I will learn two stress management techniques by December 1st. Specific, measurable. Okay, the next area is barriers. Ways in which you're, you know you're just gonna sabotage yourself. And to write those barriers down, because what can you do once you write them down? Because you know what you're gonna do better than anybody else. What happens when you have it written out? 
you can think about ways to get to, to overcome it when it occurs, right? Sure. Just and this works just the opposite way, the payoff statement. If you think about payoffs, what payoffs you'll get out of it, that will strengthen your motivation. Some other qualities are to have some kind of charts to keep a log of activities. Or maybe you'd like to express it in a, in a diary in which you have a narrative each day about how you're doing. So you've got a record of your investment in yourself. And you look at that, especially if it's charted out. We've used this with thousands of people. And you can see all that they're doing. Basically, we're just talking about a scheme for pulling something off. And these are the qualities that are being described, or the elements, rather, of a personal wellness plan. So having gone that far, let's, let's take a moment. And uh, maybe I can get a volunteer from the audience, and we'll come up with a goal or two. This is Sam uh, Clemens. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Yes. Well, certainly, I'm surprised to see you up here, but glad to have you. So am I. <laughs> Somebody uh, poked me from uh, the rear, and I uh, had to leave my chair in a sudden uh, lurch forward, and you grabbed onto me. Oh. Well, would you first of all tell me what did you list as activities that you would be willing to undertake? In the will do now category, let's say. Well, I will devote a few minutes to stretching exercises each morning. Right. For those mornings in which I uh, awake. <laughs> I hope there'll be I many of them. Uh, I rise around noon. Yes. You know, I suppose I'm not fitting in very well with all this uh, wellness lifestyle. You know, Sam, I was thinking just the opposite. I was thinking you fit in very well. For example, your sense of humor, that seems to be an important part of any kind of wellness lifestyle that I'm aware of. Well, I, I do all right, I suppose, with humor. What else uh, ought, I be, uh, ought to be looking at for a wellness lifestyle uh, about this wellness contract you all keep discussing? Well, you mentioned a few things that you might possibly work on, uh, that smoking might be an area that you might like to uh, cut down on or maybe cut out altogether sometime? Let's travel on some other territory. Where else do you think? Well, maybe uh, in the area of exercise. Maybe, maybe you'd like to get out and do a little more hiking, walking, that kind of thing? Well, I walk, yes. Never saw a benefit in being tired, so walking is not tiresome. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the use of alcohol, maybe uh, there's an area there that you'll want to think a little bit about. Well, I, I do drink uh, two hard scotches every night uh, before I go to bed uh, as a preventative of toothache. I've never had the toothache. I, I don't ever intend on having the toothache. You know, the nice thing about planning a wellness lifestyle is that you do it for yourself, somebody else doesn't do it for you. So you have a chance to pick out the things you really want to work on. So kind of up to you, Sam. So your contract would really be something personal, something that's right for you. And what's right for Dave might not be right for you, or what's right for me might not be right for you. I see. So it's very individual. One uh, individual becomes responsible for one's own life, lifestyle. Now that's an important uh, thing, I think, because in uh, one civilization, every person is uh, obligated to uh, uphold the laws uh, of, of the society, or the universe, or, or one's own lifestyle. What do you think about a wellness contract? Are you willing to give it a try? I'm willing to look it over. I've looked at it a little bit. I'm willing to look at it in detail, a thorough detail. And I might even, um, well, I don't want to make a commitment at this moment, but um, Hmm. You never can tell. <laughs> I just might do it.
you don't change him by uh, my smoking habits is a small thing perhaps well painful and difficult to do like uh, getting a fish hook out of flesh but uh, small compared to uh, changing the environment <laughs> and um, promoting health I suspect that's a taller order you know change is the key people never are at rest or fixity one was progress or retrogress change is the key the hurdle that must be got over well i'm very interested in all this uh, wellness uh, lifestyle and i i'm also very excited after several days learning about it of creating my own uh, contract but here we are my hometown hannibal my home here my fellow citizens now, how am I going to bring wellness to all my community? Now, now I do know that uh, community is like a family. That's a controlling principal idea. But how do I share that with uh, my fellow citizens? Well, Sam, we're just delighted that you've made such a lot of progress these last few days, and we think that here in Hannibal, you're going to be able to get this whole thing moving in this town and get together with some of your friends and share with them just how well you're doing at all of this. And I think they'll want to get be with you. How do I implement it? How do I get them in? Well, maybe uh, real soon you can just get a whole group of people together, some of your friends, and some of the people around your neighborhood and sit down and talk with them about the things you're experiencing and ask them if they'd like to become involved, just like you've been. Now tell me, what are the rules that can be instituted in uh, this wellness program? Well, I think there are a couple of things that all of us could keep in mind. One of the things is to be positive, and you're such a positive fellow, uh, I'm sure that'll work out very, very well. People don't like to have people telling them what they're not doing right, and much better if we can tell them what they are doing right. So you be positive. Be positive. I think a second uh, thing is is to let people be free to make their own decisions so that uh, we're not telling people how to behave. They're really making the choices for themselves. So people have choice in the matter. Right. They are responsible. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, rather than just talk about it theoretically, though, we've got a couple of people here who are really doing it. Well, I know, and I'd like to meet him. Well, I haven't a, met him yet. We've got a young woman here, Nancy Randall, who's, uh, who I know lives a wellness lifestyle and practices it right in her home and uh, where she works and things. Well, how do you do it? Uh, nutrition or uh, what? Uh, what do you do? I think it's all those things. Nutrition and loving your friends and having people over and sharing times and getting some exercise with people. and. I think asking people for support, letting them know you need their help, I think that's all a big part of it. Cool. Do you have a chance, and I've experienced this, uh, do you have a chance to spend some time uh, by yourself uh, to Definitely. Uh, rest, relax, Definitely. meditate? Making time for yourself and the things you enjoy doing that help you relax and letting people know you need that. You need time by yourself. That sounds important. And Sam, we have another person here, Dick Ellerbrake, who's the president of a hospital, Deaconess Hospital down in St. Louis, not far from here, and he's using this in his hospital with all of the, the employees of the hospital, uh, and uh, he's part of it himself. Maybe you'd like to hear a few things from Dick. Uh, what's, what's happening down at the hospital? <laughs> well, Sam, you got to be a missionary. If you can get the top people in the organization to say this is a great thing, and be positive-minded about it, it, uh, it filters all through the organization. We've got 1,800 people, as Bob says, who are having an opportunity to practice some of the good things. They're not being forced to do it, but they're given an opportunity. The food that we lay before them at the meal times, the exercise opportunities, the encouragement that we give them through seminars, we're taking all of these people, small groups at a time, two days at a time, out to a conference center giving them a wonderful opportunity with their family members even. That sounds important. It's exciting. And you're getting people who have decided that they are going to lose 10 pounds, they're going to quit smoking, they're going to start exercising, they're going to take time for the important things in life and rethink their priorities. And the exciting thing that I find about it is in a healthcare situation where we're trying to help people who are patients 
we're now able to say, look, here we've got 1,800 people who are good role models of what health is all about. Because health and wholeness and salvation, as a scholar such as yourself knows, all rooted from the same Greek words, the same root. It sounds like you've created a general insurrection. It's marvelous <laughs> insurrection. Would that all of them could be this much fun. More than that, you just think what a happy world it would be if all would do likewise. It sounds like a revolution, really. And I'm a revolutionist. You know, Sam, one thing that you remind me of is the fact that when we talk about wellness, we're talking about wellness for ourselves, for the organizations that we're a part of, Stick has mentioned, for our families, and for our communities. And when we can put all of these together, it's much easier to keep these kinds of things going. Sam, the same kind of breakthroughs that we had on the cruise can be replicated in your organizations and your families and your communities across the world. Well, I'm all for that. I keep traveling around the world myself. I'll just take wellness around with me. We'll all be well. Farewell. <laughs> Thank you.